Yes, the agenda of the event uh, begins with a brief introduction to PetroTeach, and then uh, we introduce our distinguished instructor, uh, Mr. Jerry Rusmak, uh, followed by webinar lecture, which lasts for 45 to 60 minutes. And uh, next, we will give some information about the course agenda on casing and cementing by PetroTeach. Finally, we will have a Q&A session for approximately 15 to uh, 20 minutes. So PetroTeach is a global provider of the high quality training solutions to the oil and gas industry. We are providing at the moment more than 150 training courses by up to uh, 50 distinguished instructors with high track record from both academia and industry. Our training styles include online public and in-house courses. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, PetroChich is mainly uh, focused on the distance learning. For more information, please visit our website www.petro-teach.com and download the course catalog. You may also follow us in social media and do not forget to watch our video on videos on PetroTeach YouTube channel. Uh, the event today is a part of the 20 webinar series that PetroTeach will be offering during year 2020. For the September, we run successfully uh, six webinars on diverse topics started on Nightmare of Hydric Black Age by Professor Bahman Tohidi. And we wrap up the month with the last um, talk by Professor Rumi Iledar on elements of fiscal regimes and impact on EMP economics and take statistics. All of those webinars are available, recorded uh, and uh, available on the Petro Teach TU channel. Please, if you have um, forgot to attend, you can watch them in our YouTube channel. Uh, this month, we will start um, by casing and cementing designed by Mr. Jerry Rusnak, and we will have planned to run four webinars for October, and also we will come more webinars for November and December. Please follow us up on uh, LinkedIn and also social media, also our website to get updated for these uh, webinars and these events. So we welcome and are pleased that Mr. Rusnak can join us today. Um, Mr. Rusnak holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Ocean Engineering from Florida Atlantic University. He has more than 40 years of oil field experience. He has worked in all phases of in the industry, including service, supply, operation, and academia. He began his career as a wireline field engineer. Then he worked for an independent exploration and production company as a field engineer, where he, ma he was managing well site drilling, completion, and work over operations. Moving up, he became the same company's drilling and completion manager in charge of multiple simultaneous drilling and completion operations across U.S. He is an active member and past section president of the Society of Petroleum Engineers and holds and is eligible to hold most major certifications required for well site work both onshore and offshore. So let's uh, move to the presentation. I want to remind you that all you can post your questions using the same chat box introduced at the beginning. At the Q&A session, after the lecture, they will be answered. So I'm going to hand over the talk to Jerry, to address his presentation here. Here you are. <coughs> Hello. Let me get my yes, um, I think you were given the possibility to share your screen, and um, at least I am hearing you. I hope that the audience will also will hear you. If there is any problem, 
hearing Jerry, please let us know and write uh, and note us on the chat box that you have. Yes, please. <clears throat> okay, well, hello everybody and welcome to my webinar on casing and cementing. See if I can get it. Uh, there we go. Okay, let's talk about the objectives of today's course. Uh, main objective is answer the question: What does the engineer in charge need to know in order to properly case and cement a well? So the topics that we're going to talk about include the American Petroleum Institute or API standards for oil well tubulars or casing the number of casing strings required to drill a well, the setting depth or casing point for each one of these strings, the borehole or bit size for each one of these casing strings, the strength and metallurgy required, the primary cement job design for each string, how to evaluate a primary cement job and how to remediate an unsuccessful primary cement job. So we'll begin by talking about the API casing standards. First, there's the size or the outside diameter of the body of the casing, which API has standards for casing as small as four and a half. Uh, sorry, feet. Jerry, to stop you. Um, I think we can't see your uh, presentation. Would you please uh, try to reshare with that with us? Okay. So you can't see this green. How about this? Um, Let's see. Oh, here we go. How about now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think we are going to see that. Yeah. Missed yeah, a button. So we can, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no problem. So we can continue. <laughs> I'm sorry, um, guys. Let me put this other one up. Happens. Here. No worries. Is this is this one up now? Also. Yeah. Yeah. If it's, that's fine. If you just put it in full screen, that we can see it very well. Yeah, that's fine. If you just okay. change one slide, yeah, that's fine. I think we can continue. Sorry for interrupting. Okay. That's all right. Let me catch up here. Okay, so we'll begin by talking about the uh, API casing standards. And the first one is the size, which is the outside diameter of the body of the casing. And it ranges from four and a half inches up to 36 inches. The next standard is for the weight, which we measure in pounds per foot. And with the size, the weight will determine the inside diameter or the wall thickness of the body of the casing. Then we have a casing grade, which is designated with a letter and a number. And this determines the metallurgy of the casing and its minimum yield strength, normally measured in 1,000 PSI. And then we have a standard for the length, and we talk about it in ranges. We have three ranges. Range one is from 16 to 25 foot in length, range two from 25 to 34 feet in length, and range three greater than 34 feet in length. And then we also have the type of connection and API recognizes three types of connections. There's the short thread and collar with an eight round thread, a long thread and collar, with an eight round thread and a buttress thread and collar. Talking a little bit more about the connections, 
we can say that the pressure seal on the connections, the API connections, can either be an interference fit on the threads or a metal-to-metal -metal type seal, and that the connection strength will normally be different than the body strength, and also the outside diameter of the connection is larger than the outside diameter of the tube. So how many casing strings will you run? Well, we can generally break them down into conductor casing, surface casing, intermediate casing, and production casing. So let's talk a little bit about the purpose of each of these casing strings. The conductor casing is the casing string that's put into the well first. On land wells, it's used to prevent the sides of the hole from falling into the well bore. And this casing string is some con sometimes called drive pipe because uh, in general, it's a short length, uh, anywhere from 40 to maybe a couple hundred feet. And sometimes it's actually driven into the ground. And it's run uh, because on the shallow sections or the surface of most wells, onshore, you're drilling into uh, unconsolidated sediment or basically soil, and uh, it uh, is much looser than compared to the consolidated strata that you're typically going to encounter once you get to, at some depth in the well. Now, offshore, the drive pipe or structural casing may be installed prior to the conductor for similar reasons. You may have to drive the pipe down into the soft mud on the seabed before you reach anything that you can set a casing string in. So moving on to the surface casing, the minimum depth that we set the surface casing is often determined by some government regulation or governing body because one of the main purposes for the surface casing is to cover or protect the freshwater zones. And normally, the surface casing, for the same reason, is going to be cemented from total depth back to the surface. Another purpose or main purpose of the surface casing is it must support the weight of all the other casing strings that you run because they will be set on top of it. When considering the depth of the surface casing, you need to consider that the fracture pressure at the shoe or the bottom of the casing must exceed the maximum reservoir pressure or pore pressure expected before the next string is run. And the blowout preventer or well control valves is initially made up to the surface casing head. And then you will test the blowout preventer. And also, sometimes after you drill out the surface casing, you will perform a formation integrity test, sometimes called a fit test, to make sure that the fracture pressure at the shoe does indeed exceed the reservoir pressure that you're anticipating before running the next string of casing. Next, we'll talk about the intermediate casing. Intermediate casing strings are optional. In other words, they are not always run, but they are normally run if the mud weight required to overcome the reservoir pressure will exceed the frac pressure on the previously run string or below the previously run string. And sometimes we run intermediate casing because we are anticipating what we call troublesome zones as we drill ahead or that we will be encountered. And these are zones like lost circulation zones or zones that are prone to differential sticking of the drill string or sloughing shells that are unstable formations trying to fall into the wellbore. 
things like that. Now the top of the cement on the intermediate casing is not normally run to surface like on the surface casing, but oftentimes will overlap the casing string run previously. The production casing is the innermost or last string of casing run in the well. And its size will be determined by the size of the production tubing that you want to run inside of it. The size of the production casing will determine the size of all the other casings that are run in the well. And normally it is cemented across all zones capable of either producing fluids and or that are plan to be used for injecting fluids into. So now let's talk about the casing shoe depths and number of casing strings that we would run in a well. In conventional drilling operations, the setting depths are determined principally by the uh, mud weight and the fracture gradient. At any given depth and since these are hydraulic figures we need to consider the true vertical depth as well as the measured depth in the well and then after we determine the setting depths of the casing we need to consider the drill bit and the casing sizes of the individual casing strings that we're going to run so let's look at an example of what determines the setting depth of each string. If we look at this graph, we see that on this vertical axis, we have the depth of the well measured in feet in this case. And on the horizontal axis, we have the equivalent mud weight or what the mud weight is in the well. And we have two curves. The first one, solid curve, on the left is the pore pressure or the mud weight required to overcome the reservoir pressure at any given depth. And inside of it, we have a dashed line, which is the safety margin we want to maintain above this pore pressure. On the right hand side, we have the frac gradient or the frac pressure again measured in equivalent weight or pounds per gallon and again with a safety margin indicated by the dotted line inside of it. So this graph represents what we commonly refer to as the driller's window. By window we mean that the driller in order to safely drill the well will be trying to keep his mud weight inside this window at even any given depth until we reach TD. So in order to determine the setting depth of the casing, we start at the bottom of the well. And in this case, we'll start here at point A. where we can see that at a depth of approximately 14,000 feet, we are going to need to keep our mud weight above 18 pounds per gallon to keep it above the safe pore pressure at that depth. But if we project this 18 pound per gallon mud weight up the hole, we can see that at point B, which is slightly below 12,000 feet, this 18 pound per gallon mud weight is going to exceed our frac gradient at that depth. So therefore we are going to have to run casing above that point in order to safely control the well. So at point C, in this case, we have elected to run seven and five eighths casing at this depth. Now, as we move up the well, we can see other casing points.
for instance, as we move up the well from point C to point D, we see the same thing happening. Our mud weight of approximately 17 pounds per gallon at the depth of point C in the well is going to exceed the fracture gradient at point D in the well. So again, this will be another casing setting depth. And in this case, we choose nine and five eighths casing because the seven and five eighths casing will safely fit inside of it. And you continue this procedure moving up the well to find your other casing points, which we find another one. And at this depth at approximately 5,000 feet, where we are going to run 11 and three quarter inch casing. Above there, we don't have a problem staying in the drilling window. So the 16 inch casing would be our surface casing and its depth would be picked for some other reason, as I said before, possibly a regulatory requirement for the protection of the freshwater zones. So now that we have determined the number of casing strings and their sizes, we need to have a way of determining the bit size. And we have standard charts that have been developed by the industry that gives you a recommended bit and hole size for a given casing or liner size. And let's look at our example. Looking back over here at our chart, let's assume that we decided we wanted to run two and seven eighths production tubing at our total depth of 14,000 feet, that will require the use of five and a half inch production casing. So now, again, starting at the bottom, we can see that if we want to run five and a half inch production casing, a recommended bit and hole size for it would be six and a half inches, and the six and a half inch will fit through our seven and five eighths casing, which is our next casing size up. And in order to run the seven and five eighths casing, we would drill an eight and a half inch hole, which will, that bit will fit inside of our nine and five eighths casing, which we will want to drill a 10 and 5 eighths inch hole for. And the next casing was our 11 and 3 quarter inch casing, which we will want to drill a 14 and 3 quarter inch hole for. And then moving up, the 14 and 3 quarter inch hole will be drilled out of our 16 inch casing, which we will want to drill a 20 inch bit and hole size for. So now we have determined both our bit and hole sizes and our casing sizes down to our total depth. So now that we have our bit sizes and hole sizes, we're ready to purchase our casing string. So what do we need to consider while purchasing our casing strings? Well, we want to look, as we said before, we have to order them by size, weight, grade, range, and connection. And now that we know the setting depths for each casing string, we can determine the number of joints required for each casing string, remembering that the makeup length is going to be less than the total length because we have to make an allowance for our thread loss and also, it's good practice to, know, to order a few extra joints of casing in case one gets damaged while you're handling it or running it. Then we need to consider the logistics from the factory or distributor to the well site. And this is in, particularly important for offshore wells because if you're going to be using a floating or a floater rig, then Typically, all the casing is loaded on it before it leaves for the well site. 
Next, we need to order the required accessories. This is a good time to require or to uh, order your casing accessories because you want them to match the size and the connection type of the casing they're going to be used on. And this includes things like your float equipment, your centralizers, scratchers, stage tools, and your wellhead equipment. So what are the different well conditions we need to consider when designing or a particular casing string section? The first condition is the installation condition. What forces will it be subjected to, particularly the axial stresses, such as the weight and the shock loads and any overpull required when installing the casing. We also need to consider the pressure forces, primarily the burst and the collapse forces. And if it's a directional or a crooked well bore with a lot of dog legs in it, then we need to consider the bending stresses it will be subjected to when running in the well. The next condition would be the cementing condition which means how will these forces change while conditioning the mud and pumping the cement and or rotating and reciprocating the casing while we're cementing it. And again, let's look at the next condition, the set cement condition, or how will these forces change after the cement has set up in the well bore. Then we need to look at the completion forces, particularly if a major stimulation such as an acid or a frac job is planned down the casing. And again, how will this affect the pressure forces and the temperature forces on the casing? And last, we need to look at the production forces. When the well goes under production, we will have tubing and packer forces from the production tubing and packer. The pressure is going to change because we'll have pressure depletion as we produce the reservoir. And as these production fluids flow up to the surface, it will change the temperature forces on the casing. So for each one of these conditions, we're going to want to analyze the casing and we usually do that with computer software and the software performs what we call a finite element analysis or an FEA for each one of these previous conditions that we described. And after we run the software, we will determine the maximum stress on the casing and where it will occur in the casing string and under which one of these conditions that it will occur at. And after we determine this maximum stress, then we can select a pipe grade that has a minimum yield strength that is safely above this maximum stress that we have computed. In addition, we'll select a metallurgy from the pipe grade, and this will normally be based on the chemical forces that the casing might see, such as corrosion forces or hydrogen sulfide or carbon dioxide or some other type of stress as far as the metallurgy of the casing is concerned. And we will select a pipe weight or a wall thickness, often based on where, if we're going to spend a significant amount of time drilling inside this particular casing string, such as a surface or intermediate casing string. And we will select a design safety factor when we are doing the design for different forces. And this is oftentimes based on experience 
or sometimes the company's policy for the safety factor in the design. Now I'm going to show this brief movie of about two minutes that will just give you a look at uh, one of the, uh, I guess you'd say, more well used casing design softwares. PBI's casing design software CDEX helps users determine suitable casing strings capable of resisting potential loads. Primary burst, collapse, tension, compression, secondary bending, buckling, and temperature effect are all taken into account in this software. CDEX provides comprehensive default drilling and production burst, collapse, and axial loads. Once selected, CDEX will calculate load distribution across the casing string. User-defined loads are also an option, allowing users to input their own data. Given these options, a variety of load combinations can be constructed to simulate critical drilling situations. In CDEX, you can select casing strings from the casing database. The editable casing database facilitates adding, deleting, and modifying casing, connection, grade, material, and temperature duration. Computer selections provide users with one or multiple casing sections from the database. This can resist all selected loads and keep costs at a minimum. CDEX checks the casing strength by calculating burst, collapse, axial, and triaxial safety factors and compares them with various design factors. The selected loads are then compared with casing ratings within the overview and triaxial plots, giving users a visual of casing capabilities. Detailed calculated results are also displayed in tables. Single string or full design results may also be exported into Microsoft Word reports or printed. CDEX is equipped with many other advanced features, including temperature duration and buckling effects, direct input of survey data, importing of survey and text or PDF files, and assisted casing shoe calculations based on pore and fracture pressure. CDEX gives users the opportunity to select suitable and cost-effective casing strings, all while checking its capabilities and reducing design time in order to achieve the most successful drilling operations. For more information on CDEX and other PBI products, So as you can see, this uh, casing design software covers all the uh conditions and uh, casing will be run under. And again, another question in the casing design is where will I put the centralizers? Because the design or placement of the centralizers is critical for a good primary cement job. And you need to have the proper standoff or distance from the outside of the casing to the well bore in order to get good mud removal or cement coverage. But most of these casing design programs will also have a module or a computer program that will assist you in optimizing the centralizer placement so that you get the amount, but not more than you need, of centralization. Now, so after the casing installation, now we're ready to perform the primary cement job. And the design of the primary cement job is based on drilling mud removal, pore pressure and frac pressure again, because we have to be able to maintain our well control, the top of cement that's required for each string, the strength of the cement that's required for each string. <clears throat> when we're pumping the cement job, we need to consider the cementing equipment, such as the cementing head, and the cementing head is what we attach the pump truck to at the top of the casing string, 
and it also provides us the means to rotate and reciprocate the casing while we're pumping the cement. And it also is the plug container which holds the top and bottom wiper plugs. And these wiper plugs, the bottom wiper plug, is used to wipe the drilling mud off the inside of the casing and to separate the drilling mud from the cement slurry pumped behind it. The top wiper plug is the last plug that goes into the hole, and it's what separates the cement slurry from the displacement slurry and also provides a positive seal against the float collar so that we know exactly how much fluid we pumped to displace the cement and keeps us from over displacing the cement. We have scratchers that are run on the outside of the casing string adjacent to the permeable formations that help us scratch any wall cake that is built up on the wall of the formation. We have centralizers whose purpose we described previously. We have a float collar which is above a float shoe and provides check valves that keep the cement from backflowing or U-tubing back up inside the casing after it has been put in place. And these are all part of our design program. Also, we need to condition the drilling mud prior to pumping the cement system because the properties of the drilling mud for drilling the well are considerably different than the properties of the drilling mud we would like to have when pumping the cement system. We need to consider the rheology of the drilling mud and also the fluid washes and spacing fluids and cement, the rheology being basically the properties of the fluid while it is flowing. And we'll talk more about it here in a minute. We need to ensure compatibility of all these fluids as some contamination is unavoidable, even though we have plugs separating the different fluids once they get into the annulus and are moving up into the annulus and there'll be some mixing between the drilling mud, the cement and the other fluids. And we want to make sure they're compatible so that we don't uh, have problems when they get contaminated. Next, let's look at the major cement slurry properties. We have the water to cement ratio, which is usually measured in gallons per sack and goes a long ways towards determining what the density of our cement slurry is going to be. We have the slurry density, which can be adjusted by different types of additives to either reduce or increase the density of the cement. We have fluid loss, which is measured using a press and is a measure of how easily the water comes out of the cement while it's being pumped. We have our thickening time, usually measured in minutes, which is the amount of time we have to pump or put the cement in place before it becomes unpumpable because it's too thick. You want your thickening time to give you adequate time to pump it into place, but any time after that, the waiting on cement time is an additional expense that you would like to minimize. Again, we have the slurry rheology, which we'll talk about here in a minute. We can use cement additives to adjust these cement properties. We've got accelerators to speed up the thickening time, retarders to slow down the thickening time, fluid loss additives to control the fluid loss properties of the cement, dispersants, which are basically 
friction reducers to make it easier to pump the cement and reduce the hydraulic horsepower required. We have extenders to give you a larger yield or fill up and usually measured in cubic feet per sack for the cement. We have weighting agents to adjust the density of the cement. We have lost circulation materials that we can use if we have zones that are apt to lose circulation of the cement into. And there are many other additives that cover other special conditions that we might encounter during the cement job. Okay, so let's talk about rheology. Definition of rheology is the study of flow and deformation of fluids. In well cementing, the rheology affects the cement slurry mixability and pumpability, the cement coverage, which is basically related to the mud displacement, the friction pressure estimation or the equivalent circulating density when the cement is flowing up the annulus. And this affects the hydraulic horsepower requirements, which is the pump pressure times the pump rate. Looking further at the rheology, we can see that depending upon the rheology of the cement, it will flow in different regimes. The first one being laminar flow, where the flow up the channel is in a layer type configuration with the maximum velocity being in the middle of the channel and the minimum velocity being at the wall of the channel. The next flow regime is turbulent flow, and that's flow where the fluid goes under irregular fluctuations or mixing in contrast to the laminar flow. And a special regime is the plug flow at very low velocities or pump rates. The flow will be similar to the laminar flow, but the velocity at the outside of the flow stream will be approximately the same as the velocity at the inside of the flow stream. We have a quality called Reynolds number and Reynolds number is how we predict the type of flow pattern we're going to have. That is, is it going to be plug, laminar, or turbulent? And it is designed, or excuse me, it is defined as the Reynolds number. And the Reynolds number is equal to the fluid density times the average fluid velocity times the diameter of the channel divided by the fluid viscosity. And it is a dimensionless number. We have a critical Reynolds number, and the critical Reynolds number, usually greater than 3,000, is often used to determine the flow rate required to achieve turbulent flow in the annulus. The empirical evidence shows that the best regime for displacing mud in the annulus is turbulent flow, which means that we are going to want a Reynolds number above 3,000. And experience recommends that we will be seeking a minimum pump rate of eight barrels per minute. Well, how do we determine some of these fluid properties, these rheological properties? Well, in the lab, we can use instruments to measure shear stress, which is tau in this diagram, versus shear rate, which is gamma in this diagram. 
And if we use a viscosity meter, we can measure tau and gamma at different points in the diagram. And the formula relating these two will determine the viscosity of the fluid. So a plot of this data will give us an estimate of fluid viscosity under pumping conditions. And a plot of this same data will also give us an estimate of the yield point of the fluid under pumping conditions. The yield point is defined as the shear stress at zero shear rate. And the, the yield point is a measure of the amount of pressure that is applied to the fluid before it will move. So it is also a measure of how well the fluid suspends solids. We want to lower the yield point of the drilling mud as low as practically possible prior to pumping the cement job because it will be easier to displace or move it out of the way. But we only want to do this after the hole is clean because now it will have less ability to suspend solids. Okay, let's move ahead to the job execution. For a successful job execution, the well site manager and the cementing crew well site supervisor need to be involved in the job execution, beginning with planning or designing the job. Communication is going to be the key to successful job execution. So after you have pumped the job, we need to have a job evaluation. It begins by a comparison or comparing the calculated job design parameters with the actual parameters that were measured and recorded when you were executing the cement job. This includes the pump rate, the pump pressure, and the slurry density and the liquid density at a minimum. And we also want to collect and preserve cement samples at somewhat regular intervals during the mixing and pumping of the cement. And we do not want to remove the free water from the samples because we need it to properly evaluate the cement sample. Some of the parameters that we can compare are we can take our expected job parameters, which is basically our surface pressure from the pump as the volume of the job progresses until at the end of the job when we're lifting the cement up the annulus on the back side of the casing we will end up with a final circulating pressure which is the pump pressure just prior to total displacement or bumping the plug and we want to measure this final circulating pressure that we calculated when designing the job with the actual job final circulating pressure that we measure at the surface prior to bumping the plug. And if these two are approximately equal, then that says that the job went according to design. We also want to consider the volume of cementing fluids pumped. We have spacer and or pre-flush pre fluids ahead of the cementing slurries. And sometimes we have different cementing slurries, maybe a lead slurry that we pump before a tail slurry. 
and we want to make sure that all the volumes of these different cementing fluids were the same as our design plan for. And the best way to do that is to inventory all the materials on location before and after the job. Another good measure of the job execution is to look at the flow line returns during the job. How did the flow rate coming out of the flow line compare to the pump rate or the rate at which we were pumping fluids into the well bore? And in consideration of this, were there any losses of returns during the cement job or we had less fluid coming out than we had pumping in? And where and when during the job did these losses occur? And also it's good to measure the density or change in density of the fluid returns. For instance, on a surface casing job, where we want to get quality cement all the way back to the surface, one of the best ways to ensure that is to measure the density of the cement returning at the surface. Another measure is to ask whether the top plug was bumped. And if so, what was the volume of displacement fluid compared to the calculated volume. When we bump the plug, we will see a sudden increase in pressure. And again, we can use the plug to perform a small casing pressure test to ensure that we had no leaks in our casing during the job. And last, we can check the float equipment. As I said earlier, the float equipment contains check valves to keep the cement from U-tubing back up the inside of the casing. So when we release the final circulating pressure at the surface, if the float equipment is working and holding, then we should have minimal flowback before the pressure bleeds off at the surface of the casing. Now, if the float equipment leaks, then we need to shut the well in at the surface, again, using the cementing head, and wait until the cement sets up before we bleed the pump pressure off to keep it from U-tubing back up to the inside of the casing. We also have wireline tools that we can use to evaluate the cement job. And one of the more common ones, we call it a bond log or a CBL, VDL, GRCCL, which stands for a cement bond log, variable density log, gamma ray log, and casing collar locator. And if we look at an example of one, we can see that in track one, we have a gamma ray log, which will give us a measure of the formation and will allow us to correlate or tie in our cased hole bond log with our open hole logs. And we also have a casing collar locator located in the depth track of the log which will tell us where the casing collars are related to depth and can be used as a perforation depth control log later where we will perforate with just a casing collar locator. As far as the bond log goes, we have two measurements and they're a measurement of the sound attenuation from the transmitter of the tool which generates the sound wave to one of two receivers on the tool, which hears the sound wave returning after it is attenuated by the formation. 
And in this particular case, we can see in track two that the CBL portion of the log has an attenuation from zero to 24 dB or decibels per foot. And where you have free pipe or above the top of the cement, you get very little to no attenuation of the sound wave. Whereas in an area where you have a good overall cement job, you have a very high attenuation rate in decibels per foot. So that's how the cement bond log measures the cement behind the casing that is bonded to the outside wall of the casing. But we also need a measurement of the cement bonding from the formation to the cement, and that's where the VDL, which is the variable density log, comes into place. If the cement behind the casing is bonded to the formation, then it will provide good acoustic coupling to the formation, and you will be able to easily distinguish free pipe where there is no cement bonding to the formation from a good overall cement job where you receive a good look at the sound waves being returned from the formation. So that's how the CBL BDL log works to evaluate the cement job. Now, if the primary cement job is unsuccessful, then how do you plan a remedial cement job? Well, you can either do what they call a high pressure squeeze where you perforate holes in the casing and pump the cement into the annulus at a bottom hole pressure that is higher than the frac pressure or you can do a low pressure remedial cement job where you pump the cement into the annulus at a pressure that is lower than the frac pressure. Or you can plan to re-cement above the top of the cement of the primary job. In either case, if or you pump a remedial cement job, you need to have a better look at the current condition of the cement behind the casing. And they make more advanced cement evaluation logs for wire lines, such as the radial cement evaluation log. Now the radial cement evaluation log in addition to you can see the VDL log and you can see the CBL log and you still have the gamma ray and casing collar locator log. But with the radial cement log, you break the annulus up into sectors or sections. You can think of them as pie shaped sections and commonly they're broke into six sections and you know the relative bearing of each section from measurements taken by the logging tool. And you can look at a cement map, which shows you in dark where you have high attenuation or good cement, to white where you have low attenuation or poor cement, and you can look all the way around the annulus in sectors to identify places where it will be easy to replace cement during the remedial job versus places where it will be difficult or impossible to place cement during the remedial cement job. Now, lastly, we talk about setting cement plugs. And if the well is not salvageable 
people because of failure of the primary or remedial cementing job, then the last thing that you might do is set cement plugs in order to abandon the well bore. And you do not want to be the engineer in charge of that. Okay, well that concludes the webinar portion of the program. And before I take questions, I'd like to briefly invite you to attend my five-day casing and cementing online course, which we've got planned for two sessions, the first one being the 26th to 30th of October, 2020, and the next one, the 25th to the 29th of January, 2021. And you can register for this course at this link. And this course will cover all the topics I talked about today, except in much more detail. And the learning objectives are obtain a working knowledge of casing design, a working knowledge of cementing procedures, to learn the practical application of different types of cements, and how to use additives to produce specific cement properties and learn much more about the equipment, tools, and techniques involved in casing and cementing a well, and how to learn to evaluate the success or failure of a cement job. So with that, we can go ahead and take questions. All right, thanks. Um... Jerry, for the very nice and informative presentation and also comprehensive in terms of covering diverse subjects in casing and cementing uh, design subject. Uh, I've enjoyed also, I hope that attendees also have been enjoyed. Um, before we go to the Q&A, I hear uh, a few audiences haven't uh, heard your voice, but I've seen presentation. I think the reason because you were sometimes joining by phone, not by the computer, so then you don't receive the voice. But anyway, this video has been recorded and it will be shared in the uh, YouTube um, Petroti channel, so you can just watch for those of you you missed the voice. So we have about um, 15 minutes um, Q&A, so please uh, ask your questions. I will also read them for uh, Mr. Ruslak and he will be answering them. Yeah. So any question from audience? So uh, we have a question, how much is the lifetime of cement back of the casing in general? Well, uh, 